Um, the the demise of the of the Mayans, it's unknown as to what happened with the Mayans. They disappeared. They don't know if it's lack of leadership. Uh, maybe their leaders died off. Maybe it was famine, natural disaster. For whatever reasons, reason the Mayans died out. Actually, died out before the Incas and the Aztecs were around. As I said before, Indians living in North America, where it's present day United States, had it tough. Just think of all the areas in America. We've been able to overcome and adapt to the cold weather or the hot weather, the snow and the ice and all those things. We've been able to overcome that. It's a tribute to us, but it's a harsh environment. So North American Indian tribes back during this time, before 1492, uh, had a tough life. And they generally grew corn, maize, three sisters farming you'll read about. They were low-tech hunter-gatherers chasing their food wherever, wherever they, they went. The most uh, well-known of the tribes was the Iroquois. They were probably the most advanced tribes when it came to, at least when it came to North American Indian tribes, they were the most advanced. They were nothing even close to the Aztecs, Mayans, and Incas, but they were advanced for North America, as, as far as North American Indians go. Uh, they had uh, a matrilineal culture, which means the power and possessions are passed down on the female side. Almost every other society, including ours, it's the male side. They uh, had democracy. They voted on things. They formed uh, unions with other tribes. And, uh, you know, they, they took care of each other. They were the closest thing that, uh, to the Aztecs, Mayas, and Incas without, without actually being those tribes. The Iroquois League uh, was, was really a group of these tribes uh, made up of the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca, and the Tuscarora. Uh, they spoke the same language. They uh, formed democratic governments, and they watched out for each other. They formed what's known as alliances, and, and it's located in present-day New York is where the Iroquois Indians were predominantly. Another uh, adaptation here, we've done a great job of a society of adapting to the weather and to the conditions, but here's an example back during this time before Columbus, the Pueblo Indians located in the Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico. Here's a, a great example of adaptation. The Pueblo had to, you know, the tough thing was how hot it was. They had to, to, to make sure that they're in a shaded area because it was so hot. It was really cold at night. This protects them from the cold. It also protects them from attack. You can see that it's tucked under this uh, mountain, or, and it's it really you can't see it. They'd have ladders that would go up to the top floor where, they, where they'd sleep at night. They'd pull the ladders up so they wouldn't be attacked. So protection and adaptation was big for North American Indian tribes. There's a little closer view at that. Kind of cool. Okay, let's get into some of the indirect discoverers of America. There's obviously we're gonna we're gonna assume that you know that the direct discoverer of America would be Columbus, although he may he probably wasn't the first even European to reach North America, but we'll get into that. The original Native American, the player I called him who came across the Bering Strait, you got to give that guy some credit for being the direct discoverer of America. The Vikings who came over before that, the Crusaders, the birth of nation states, Marco Polo, Gutenberg's printing press, Prince Henry School uh, for Navigators, all could be uh, contributors to it. And you'll understand what I'm talking about as we go on. So give some credit to the first guy walking across the player. We know we've already talked about that. The Vikings supposedly, I'm not going to read all that to you. Uh, the Vikings supposedly uh, came over about 500 years before. It was Leif Erikson, son of Eric the Red, who came over from uh, uh, Norway. And they crossed over to Greenland, to Iceland, and on to what, what they called Vinland at the time, which is in Canada today. There have been found what they think are artifacts that belong to the Vikings and belong to Leif Erikson, but they didn't write anything down, so we can't give them direct credit for being there. We're not 100% positive, but probably in the 90-something percentile that they were there before Columbus was, but they just didn't write anything down or report anything. As much as a series of wars, the Crusades, 
could be given credit for um, being an indirect discoverer of America. I'll explain to you why that is. The Crusades, series of wars over Jerusalem, between the Mus fight between the Muslims and the Christians. For our purposes, that's not what we're going to get into and talk about. What we will talk about is there was a whole bunch of nation states all over Europe. There was no such thing as France and England and and Italy and those places. They came came about later. Uh, from your world history studies, you may understand and know about feudalism. Uh, there, there were feudalistic societies all throughout Europe, and people were afraid to leave manors. Their manor, were, which was a self-contained, walled community that they lived in. You had serfs who were working. The lord ran, ran the, uh, the manor, and people were just afraid to venture out. That's going to change when the pope comes and asks a lot of these lords to uh, let him rent, I guess you could say, or borrow the uh, serfs so they could go fight for the, for the Holy Land. And, and they did. And those people who went over there to fight, they went east and they saw all kinds of cool things like spices and different kinds of uh, like gold. And the spices were really, really good. Made meat that was spoiled, tastes better, and obviously the value of gold. They're seeing things that they'd never seen before. They came back and told stories about how wonderful things were, and it piqued people's interest. Europe is in a period known as the Dark Ages. They were doing nothing. They were exploring nothing. They were on sleepy manners, and they refused to go out or do anything. This changed everything. So once that happened, stories went around, and pretty soon kings emerged, lords knocked down their walls and took over the, the manor next door because they, were, they wanted more power and they wanted more money. And the way to get that, they figured out, was to send people out in search of gold. Gold was huge. Gold is huge. So uh, these manors were, the, the, system, the system of manners and uh, feudalism was ended and it led to the rise of nation states. Portugal, Spain, France, and Germany and kings that wanted more power. So they're sending people out to get the. And one of them just happened to, mistakenly, Columbus, back into the Western Hemisphere. Okay, let's talk about Marco Polo. Marco Polo wrote a book called The Book of Sir Marco Polo, where he talked about his journey, where he left, and he was over 20 years uh, traveling east, looking at what was going on and tell, coming back and telling stories and writing it in his book about how wonderful things are over there. Kings later on read the book and sent more people out to explore. So one guy, an Italian explorer, Marco Polo, came back with stories and the word's going to get out that there's a lot of great things if you go east. So they wanted to send more explorers out. Not very many people read the book of Sir Marco Polo because you had to handwrite the copy if you wanted to make a copy for somebody until Gutenberg in 1455 invented the printing press. That changed everything. Now you can mass produce books. Uh, we'll talk talk in class about how this worked. Not too, not too difficult, but uh, it was very primitive, the first printing press, but you can sure as heck print 100 copies of page one really quickly. And then once you're finished with that, you could print 100 copies of page two, and so on and so forth till you finish the book, and then you have 100 copies in the end. The price of books went down, information went out, kings got fired up, kings are desperate for more money, and they send explorers out. But many of the explorers didn't know about sailing. Education comes into play. When you, uh, you know, want to learn about about something, obviously books. There are now books available at this point. But Prince Henry School for Navigators. Uh, Prince Henry was from Portugal. Portugal took the lead in sending people out, venturing out, uh, sending sailors out. He taught them about the winds, the tides. Uh, they invented a ship called a caravel, which would go against the wind. Uh, they invented a compass because they were so afraid of uh, sea monsters and they were afraid of getting lost at sea like so many explorers early on were just lost at sea. They lost their way, they got confused, and they were never to be heard or seen again and probably died in the middle of the ocean somewhere. And obviously, that petrified sailors. They were so afraid of it. But when, once they got to work in school, in Prince Henry School for the Navigators, they got the word out and they were figuring out how to sail. 
So they were venturing out even more. Two uh, students that are most well known from Prince Henry School for Navigators are the two Portuguese sailors, one by the name of Diaz, one by the name of de Gama. And uh, here's their, their uh, contribution to history. You had first off uh, Bartholomew Diaz was the, the first to reach the tip of Africa. Earlier I showed you the map of the known world at the time. They knew Africa about halfway down. No one had ventured to the bottom of Africa. Um, they're trying to get to the east to go get all that gold and all the things that are out there that they're fired up about. Uh, walking across just didn't cut it. It was too hard to carry all this gold and silk. Silk was another thing that was really sought after in Europe. Um, the Italians had a, a monopoly over trade. And to break the Italian trade monopoly, they wanted an all-water route to Asia, which they could then fill their ship full of silk and gold and spices and turn around and go back and then make money hand over fist. So Diaz is searching for the tip of Africa because he knows if he could reach, reach the tip of Africa, he could go all the way around because he assumed that the world was round and that he wouldn't, he wouldn't sail off the edge like so many sailors were afraid of earlier. So it took him a long time. He went back and forth trying to reach the tip because the further he went, he'd, alert, he'd get more afraid, and obviously they'd run out of supplies. But then finally, in 1480, excuse me, it was 1486 when uh, Diaz reached the tip of Africa and then turned around and came back because he ran out of supplies. It wasn't until 1497 when Vasco da Gama sailed all the way around. He, he went all the way around, so not 1497, and you know that's after Columbus set, set sail as well. So Portugal was pretty sure uh, that they they refused to, they actually refused to finance Columbus's journey because they had already had somebody Diaz who reached the tip of Africa, and they knew that they can get to Asia with an all water route. So they actually refused Columbus. He wanted them to pay for his uh, journey. Okay, so all these different trade routes, they call it Colombian Exchange for obvious reasons after Columbus. The, the trade between North America and, and uh, you know, Africa and, and Europe and mostly Europe and, and North America, it's called Colombian trade because of Colombian Exchange because of, of Columbus. But you could see all the different trade routes. In red, you see that's, that's the, the northern route, mostly it was the Italians that were dominating trade there. But then the blue shows you uh, da Gama going all the way around. Once they did that, they had successfully broken the Italian monopoly over trade. And by doing that, Portugal is going to make a lot of money and it's going to emerge as a world power temporarily. Spain and Portugal were the, were the two world powers at the time. <clears throat> so let's talk more about Christopher Columbus and his journey. He had an interesting thought. Columbus said, I truly believe that the earth is a lot smaller than it is and that I think you could sail west to get to the east. So he thinks that the whole Diaz going all the way down to the tip of uh, Africa, that was too far, way too far. So he says, I think you could sail west, go to, to the east and get there faster. What he didn't know is how big the earth is. And what he didn't know was that a big landmass blocked his way. So first, uh, Christopher Columbus, who was Italian, but Italy wouldn't finance his journey because they already have, they don't want an all-water route. They, they dominate trade in Europe for silk. 